Good afternoon, and welcome to Creative Literature with Mr. Friesen. Mm. Yeah. Today we're going to be talking about three poems by Ko Un. We're going to be starting off with The Passage of Time from the collection of Songs for Tomorrow. We're going to be talking about the poem Poem Te from 10, 10 Thousand Lives, and also Headmaster Ape from 10 Thousand Lives. First poem, Passage of Time. Let me read it. Long ago, on his deathbed, the Buddha said, In days to come, when I am no more, I beg you, make no images of me. After that request, the people who had lost their master had no choice. The Buddha was nowhere else but in their hearts. Everywhere they went, no matter where, he was surely within. But that, it seemed, was not enough. Since he'd become enlightened at Bogaya, at dawn under the Bodhi tree, People took one leaf from that tree, offering it reverence, bowed down to it, joining palms before it. Then one day, some artists of Gantara, inspired by Greece, carved sensuous statues of seated Buddhas, to which people offered reverence, bowed down, palms joined. So what this poem is talking about is the contrast between the, what Buddhism should have been and what it turned out to be. It's uh, interesting that, that Kuhn decided to write about this because one of the central issues in this poem, one of the central themes, is the uh, concept of idolatry. Idolatry, to worship an idol. This is a very prevalent theme in Judaism. It's, it's a very common theme, actually. In the uh, Hebrew scriptures, throughout the history of the people of Israel, people would be God's people, they would be worshipping him, and then they would move away, and they would worship other idols, other gods. They would build various Asherah poles, they would build, um, they would build pillow statues, and all sorts of other religious iconry to, uh, to various gods of people around there. But in this poem, it's not about Christianity, it's not about Judaism, it's about Buddhism, and it's about how Buddha originally asked people to not make images of him. Now, this is Ko'un writing. When I was doing some background research on this poem, I couldn't really find any information that Buddha had actually said this. But nevertheless, these tenets are definitely within Buddhism. We've got one of my students in the back of the class who thinks she's a rap star of some sort. <laughs> do, do you want me to take a picture? Sorry. No, that's okay. We don't need to. We don't need to. It's okay. It's all right. I'm all right, sorry. Back do there. the palm yeah. shoot. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. As I was talking about, as I was saying, in Buddhism, take two. Guys, <laughs> let the man talk. <laughs> We're finally getting an accurate picture of what this class is really like. <laughs> so in Buddhism, you're not supposed to have idols. You're not supposed to be worshipping. You're supposed to hold everything very lightly. You must take everything in moderation. Some would argue that a good Buddhist would also take Buddhism in moderation. Cue laughter. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got two sections in this poem. The first poem is when Buddha is alive, and then after his death. We've got a turn in stanza three, but that scene was not enough. It wasn't enough. And what this is talking about is this very common theme in religion that at times, faith is not enough. Give me the proof. Give me the ocular proof, a fellow says, when faced with his wife's infidelity. In Christianity, after Christ has died, Doubting Thomas, one of the apostles, says, Let me feel the holes through your hand to prove that you are actually dead and you came back from life. It's not enough. We want to see. We want to have proof. We don't want to just believe. This poem spans hundreds, if not thousands, of years. From when Buddha was alive, the original Buddha, to when they started to make statues and representations of and nowadays, we do have people who do bow down and pay reverence to, if not worship, Buddhist statues. So, aside from this very interesting take on idolatry from a Buddhist perspective, it's again emphasizing the longevity of Korea's history. The fact that, you know, Korea has been in existence for so long, 
that this could take place over the course of its history. And this is not an exclusively Korean poem. I mean, we're talking with Buddhism here, uh, which originated on the Indian Peninsula. But we have seen that Buddhism is an important part of Korean culture. So, let's look at Poem Tae. Poem Tae from 10,000 Lives. You and I vied for first place in grade school. You from a rich house had really nice clothes. Your five buttons always shining bright. And every day a boiled egg snuggled bright in your lunchbox, where the white rice contained very little barley. But you were never boastful, oh no. Not by so much as a fingernail paring. We had a paddy field just beside yours. But you and I get on well together, he said. And you gave me dried rice cakes. But Pong Tae, first your father died when the Reds pulled back north. Then you were dragged off by the local people, died in a cave in Helmy Mountain, shot by a black UN soldier. One moonlit night in a dark cave you died. Pong Tae, ah, uh, I couldn't do anything to save you, though you were 16 and I was 16. Now again, in this poem, we do have some clues about what country this action takes place, and it is, again, North Korea. The second half of the poem, first your father died when the Reds pulled back north. So the Reds, the communists, when they pulled back north. Now during the Korean War, the front line of the war went north and south and north and south. It wasn't ever one static line, like the Maginot Line in World War I. The war raged from the north of Korea to the south of Korea, all the way from up to Pyongyang, which is now capital of North Korea, to just north of Daegu, which is in the southern part. So a huge range. So back and forth, back and forth. Villages would be part of the North Korean forces one day and South Korea the next. So we can assume that because we're talking about the Reds and because we're talking about how this village was now part of the um, was part of South Korea at that point. We can assume that this place sometime during the, uh, this, during the Korean War. The fact that he was shot by a black UN soldier, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, Colin is, is very careful to point out that the soldier was black. Whether this was to emphasize that it wasn't a Korean, because there aren't any black Korean people, or whether he was making some sort of comment of race, I'm not sure. But what we do know for sure is that this is, again, another poem that confounds our nations of North Korea being bad and South Korea being good. Everything was fine when Pong Tae was living in North Korea. His family had enough food. Everything was going great. It was only until South Korea came up from the north that he was dragged off by the local people. The father was dragged off, and he was shot by a UN soldier. This confounds our notions, again, of, of North Korea bad and South Korea good. The UN forces came in to save people from the North Korean menace. Cohen is not, he's not a communist sympathizer. He's not somebody who is, um, I mean, he's very well respected and very well loved in South Korea. But what he's doing is he's trying to emphasize the fact that the Korean people are all Korean. They're all brothers and sisters. And just because they live on one or another side of an ideological boundary that was set up by powers in the West, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily enemies. Whether you're North Korean or whether you're South Korean, it doesn't matter, you're Korean. And finally, we're going to move on to Headmaster Abe again from 10,000 Lives. <clears throat> Headmaster Abe Sudomu from Japan. A fearsome man with his round glasses, fiery hot like hottest pimentos. When he came walking, clip-clop down the hallway with the clacking sound of his slippers cut out of a pair of old boots, he cast a deathly hush over every glass. In my second year during ethics class, he asked us what we hoped to become in the future. Kids replied, I want to be a general in the Imperial Army. I want to become an admiral. I want to become another Yamamoto Isoroko. I want to become a nursing orderly. I want to become a mechanic in a plane factory and make planes to defeat the American and British devils. Then Headmaster Aid asked me to reply. I leapt to my feet. I want to become the Emperor. Those words were no sooner spoken than a thunderbolt fell from the blue above. You have formally, formally blasphemed the venerable name of His Imperial Majesty. 
You are expelled this instant. On hearing that, I collapsed into my seat. But the foremaster pleaded. My father put on clean clothes and came and pleaded. And by the skin of my teeth, instead of expulsion, I was punished by being sent to spend a few months sorting through a stack of rotten barley that stood in the school grounds, separating, separating out the still usable grains. I was imprisoned every day in a stench of decay, and there, under scorching sun and in beating rain, I realized I was all alone in the world. Soon after those three months of punishment were over, during ethics class, Headmaster Abe said, We're winning! We're winning! We're winning! Once the great Japanese army has won the war, in the future, you Peninsula people will go to Manchuria, go to China, and take important positions in government offices. That's what he said. Then a B-29 appeared, and as the silver four-engine plane passed overhead, our headmaster cried out in a big voice, They're devils! That's the enemy! He cried furiously. But his soldiers drooped. His shout died away into a solitary mutter. August 15th came. Liberation. We left for Japan in tears. Is that right now in I'm sorry, what was that? They're in Korea right now, and they left for Japan in their place. Headmaster Abe was Japanese, and this takes place in uh, on the Korean Peninsula. It talks about that towards the end. Once the great Japanese army has won the war in the future, you Peninsula people will go to Manchuria, go to China. So that's our one clue in the poem that we're not talking about Japan itself, because Japan is an island, whereas Korea is a peninsula. So this is taking place in a Korean school during the Japanese occupation, and in fact during the later part of the occupation. And at the very end of the poem, at the very, very end of World War II, once Japan has been defeated. We also know this because when the speaker in the poem leaps to his feet and says that he wants to become the emperor, this is blasphemy. It's blasphemy. It's something outrageous that a Korean could take the imperial throne in Japan. We don't know whether the speaker is being serious, whether he's being caught up in patriotic fervor. His other squad mates, his, his uh, friends are talking about being part of the army, an admiral, a uh, nursling orderly, mechanic in a plane factory. Perhaps he's just swept up and he wants to become part of the Japanese government as well. And he says, I want to be the emperor. Or maybe he is being a little bit sneaky. Maybe he's being a little bit sarcastic here. He, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really say that he wanted to stay in school. His form master, this is an equivalent to a teacher, wanted him to stay. And his father wanted him to stay. And by the skin of his teeth, he stayed. But perhaps this was this young man's attempt at rebellion against the Japanese headmaster that was in charge of his school. So, 10,000 Lives, as we've talked about before, is Cohen's attempt to write a poem about every single person that he's ever met in his life. I don't know whether Headmaster Abe actually existed or not, but given that this is a biographical project, I'm assuming that he did, and this probably does reflect an accurate history in Cohen's life. So we talked a little bit in an earlier class about the occupation of Japan and how it was or the occupation of Korea, and how it was a very brutal event in Korea's history. And the fact that these children want to be a part of the Japanese war machine, and in fact that's what they're expected to say during this Japanese ethics class. It's uh, it's it's indicative of the fact that these, these kids are not doing what they want to do. Much like students in a small school in Munrek on February 15, 2012, who are listening to a lecture on a poem that they probably had no interest in. <laughs> Unlike that event, however, these students have the choice to walk out. In Japan, in Japan controlled Korea, they didn't have a choice. They had to be part of that ethics class. They had to give the right answers, and if they weren't, then they were to be expelled. And expulsion wasn't just a matter of you get to go home and you don't have to go to school. But if you don't get educated in these schools, you don't get to be a part of the government. You don't get to be part of the culture. And Jap Japan occupied Korea, you would get reduced food rations. Your family might get sent to an internment camp. 
It was not a good thing for the family, in other words, to have a rebellious child who was expelled from school. And at the very end of the poem, a B-29, an American B-29 appeared. And the headmaster calls out that they're devils, they're the enemy. But on August 15th, liberation comes, and the Japanese are forced to leave Korea. August 15th is still celebrated in Korea as the end of the occupation of Korea. So that's this poem. We've got this wonderful caricature of this Japanese man with round glasses, fiery hot, who is so passionate about his own country that he is he's on fire, essentially. But at the end of the poem, Korea wins. And that's what this poem represents. That at the end of the poem, Korea is free. Of course, as we know from Korean history, shortly thereafter, it was split up into North Korea and South Korea by the Americans and the Russians. But regardless, in this one little moment, at the end of this little poem, the speaker is able to experience freedom for Korea. And that is personified in this Japanese person. That's it today. Thanks. Yeah.